former MVP quarterback Matt Ryan to the Colts for a third round pick. Now the Colts certainly upgrading at that position this offseason after they unloaded Wentz to Washington. The Falcons though, not sure what that means for them as of now. Izzy, Matt Ryan said the Colts were a better win now option. Is that how you see it? Well, yes, that is uh, happens to be true, that the Colts are better win now. They have a good running game. They obviously looked for some more from Carson Wentz and didn't get it last season. But this also just looks to me like the Atlanta Falcons just messing up this situation with uh, Deshaun Watson. Basically, they backed up a, a situation where they had to give him some guaranteed money. And that was basically where Matt Ryan said, hey, if you're going to push me aside and try to work a deal for this guy, you're going to go ahead and lose me. And they're going to lose him with a taking the largest dead cap hit ever in the NFL. So it just kind of looks like the, the, they fumbled this a little bit, the, the Atlanta Falcons did more so than the Colts, who just got a strong quarterback for a third-round pick. See it that way as well, Pablo? Yeah, the Colts were looking for a quarterback. They had a team constructed to put a quarterback inside of that system. Wasn't Wentz. Let's bring in someone else. Yeah, Matt Ryan, after 14 years, can be that guy. But the Falcons did not have a plan for mm -hmm. this. Like, they did not see this coming. And all they got, Sarah, was a third-rounder for the greatest quarterback in franchise history, which is insult and injury. And yeah, I, I just don't think, yeah, you tank now, but I don't think you went into this necessarily trying to do that, which is a problem when you tank. Yeah, 100%. You got to plan for it, I think, at least according to the Dolphins and all the other teams in the NFL that have been proven to do so intentionally. Let's talk yes. about this, George. We think this is a good move for the Colts. We're confused about the Falcon side of things. You as well? Yeah, stop me if you've heard this before. The Falcons may have blown a big lead here, potentially, with their situation <laughs> at quarterback. And, and what I would add to it is, from a Matt Ryan perspective, the Colts are perfect. They've got a great offensive line, an excellent running game with Jonathan Taylor. Michael Pittman Jr., I think, can be a, a legitimate number one receiver in this league. They've got money to spend in free agency to add more receivers into the mix. I think the Colts and Matt Ryan are a good marriage. Yeah, this is a good setup for the Colts, in my opinion. I don't know what's going to happen with the Falcons. Harry, is this as simple as, hey, you flirted with someone else and now I want out and they're left holding the bag or uh, his uh, salary cap hit bag? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I don't think the Falcons expected this when they kind of pushed all their chips to the front of the table, not to, not to draw a Calvin Ridley reference there, but it kind of came back and bit them. I mean, you went all in on a replacement plan that was not guaranteed. It was a very you know, public thing with all the reports that were coming out and the way that they pushed his roster bonus back to even try to make this happen because they really thought that they were going to get Deshaun Watson. And, you know, it's not like they're just doing this to some guy. Like, this is Matt Ryan. Like, this is the greatest player in this franchise's history. He's the first player to give this franchise consistent expectations of, of any sort of winning, right? The Falcons didn't have back-to-back -back winning seasons until Matt Ryan came along. And so to string this along, it's, it's a really bad look by the Atlanta Falcons, especially in the same week that they lose Freddie Freeman. But I think that short term, this is pretty bad. Long term, I think they'll probably be all right. These birds ain't loyal. That's what I'm hearing. All right, look at these scores. Pablo, you cut your uh, deficit in half already. I'm proud of you. Still in the negative, left. though. We've got a lot to get to next, including Deshaun left. Watson. Be right back. Around the Horn is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Buy or sell. Let's get to the women's March Madness. Over the weekend, a record tying eight wins by double-digit seeds, including South Dakota over Baylor, ending the Bears' run of 12 straight trips to the Sweet 16 and 66 straight home wins against non-conference opponents. Also, the early exit from Caitlin Clark in Iowa at the hands of a former teammate who transferred to Creighton. And we're only halfway to the Sweet 16. We got more games today. All right, Harry, let's go to you. Biggest upset for you. For me, I'm definitely buying Creighton over Iowa. Look, Clayton Clark, Caitlin Clark, excuse me, is the most exciting player in college basketball, men's and women's, when she is on her game. She is the only other player to have the audacity to pull half-court shots with such confidence like a Steph Curry. Top, and I'll take it, it seemed like she was prime to going to be able to have a deep tournament run. She's the type of player that we love to see in the tournament go on a hot streak. And this Iowa team was one of the best that they've had in years, and it just didn't happen for them. So for me, it was definitely Creighton. Izzy, what about you? Same answer, different team? It's 
still Creighton, but it's for a reason you mentioned earlier, that transfer Lauren Jensen, who not only only scored 23 points her whole freshman season at Iowa and then scored 19 against Ooh. Iowa, but when it was down to five minutes and her team was down by four, she's the only one of her teammates that kept scoring. Four straight buckets, including a three to win it. That is one heck of a story right there for Lauren Jensen. Pretty incredible. I love the petty game. Pablo, how about you? Look, we yada yada over the last scene in the montage that you gave us, Sarah. Belmont upsetting Oregon in double overtime. Mm. Like, I understand a 12 versus a 5 is not exactly as extreme. I get it. I'm Mr. 16 over a 1. Oh, you are? But a double oh, OT upset. That. Yeah, uh, come on. I thought we had just gotten past that by now. I'm trying to make a comeback, Sarah. But, sure. All right, excellent point, though. I'll give you another point. Belmont was a big upset. George, how about you? Pity points. I'm going to go with South Dakota, the Coyotes. Thank they had you. the largest road win for a double digit seed against one of the top two seeds. And by the way, Melissa Smith also in consideration mm -hmm. for player of the year this year, along with Caitlin Clark. So a big win for the Coyotes. That was the big one for me. All right, moving on over the weekend, lots of news about Deshaun Watson. The Browns announcing the acquisition of the quarterback on Friday, but didn't put out a statement until Sunday perhaps anticipating and looking to respond to the backlash that the trade received. Also of note, the five-year, $230 million fully guaranteed deal includes a base salary of just $1.035 million in 2022. So if Watson is suspended as expected, he'll only have to pay about $57,000 for each game missed. Again, 22 civil cases still outstanding. What did you make of the statement and the specifics of Watson's contract, Pablo? that this all felt like an insult to our intelligence, Sarah, right? We're talking about an organization that released press statements saying, we did a comprehensive investigation. Turns out, per Tony Busby, the attorney for the accusers, they didn't talk to any of the women in question. Insult to intelligence. And then you have, with the Browns and the NFL more broadly, right? I mean, look, this is a guy who still has cases that are under investigation. These civil suits, depositions are still to come. The idea that you can just pretend like, hey, we did all the homework, he's good. We sort of know what's going on here. Just be honest about why it is that's happening. Izzy, how about you? Yeah, as somebody, you know, down in Miami who was a part of these all these conversations when the Dolphins were reportedly into Deshaun Watson, I didn't think it would turn into a situation where teams would then cater to Deshaun Watson the very first second that they could. And that's exactly what they did here, not only with the way the contract was drawn up, but with its, everything about it was catered to Deshaun Watson and just makes you feel dirty. If you are a Cleveland Browns fan, I'm sure there's a lot of them out there who are trying to questioning their fandom here, but this is also the NFL where if he wins, you know, after a year of maybe suspension, if he wins 12, 13, 14 games next year, it might be far away enough for some people to forget about it, so it's not a huge surprise. Miles, what was your reaction? For me, I'm buying that people are more upset about this because it felt like a bidding war for somebody like Pablo said that still has 22 active civil cases remaining. And then the other part that really stuck out to me was the Browns said that they were empathetic towards people's personal feelings towards this decision. But to me, it doesn't feel like you can say that if you go out of your way to take away what would be a consequence of his uh, alleged actions by formatting his contract in the way that they did. So to me, that part really stood out as something that, that felt pretty wrong. Absolutely. George, how about you? The contract is an utter joke, okay? I, I don't think there's any other way to describe it. And it basically makes me dismiss everything you said leading up to that. So uh, the one thing I'd like to know is spinning forward here on this story, what the press conference will look like. Is he going to have to answer questions to Sean uh, from the media? Is Jimmy Haslam going to answer questions? I'm curious to see what that looks like moving forward. Agreed. You know, uh, the Browns are going to fairly face a lot of criticism for this Watson signing, this contract, and their failure to reach out to his accusers. But it's honestly hard to imagine that many other teams would have behaved differently. There was, after all, as you mentioned, a bidding war for his services. And we've seen this time and time again, the prioritization of talent and the bottom line over everything else. But we can't just shrug our shoulders and accept the status quo. We're going to still await the outcomes of the civil cases. In the meantime, it's necessary to continue having educated conversations about cases of harassment and assault. Not because we presume guilt, but because our culture has conditioned us to blame victims and defend athletes, to believe that pay grabs and common are common and successful, which they aren't, and that the legal system will ultimately offer us a clean, satisfying answer to any questions of guilt. When the truth is, according to recent estimates by the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, just 0.6% of sexual assault cases result in incarceration. So understanding how inadequately the legal system handles these cases matters. 
What also matters? Demanding transparency and accountability from any team willing to make a man accused by over 20 women the face of their franchise. You gotta move on. And Sedano and Izzy will be the ones that do. Say goodbye to Harry and Pablo. Pablo, minus 15. Actually a pretty respectable finish for you. We'll see you in Showdown next. Oh, hello. Sarah Spain filling in for Tony Reale, who is in the final mascot tryouts to be the St. Peter's Peacock. I'm a little worried. Hard to peacock when you're wearing all black everything. He'll figure it out. Harry, Izzy, hello. George, same rules as last time. You get points off every time you start an argument with look or listen, okay? I promise I will be both looking <laughs> and listening when you talk. Pablo, hi. Hi, that whole pick in a 16 over a one stick never gets old. And you know what? Neither does deducting an obscene <laughs> amount of points when that pick is once again wrong. So do you remember how much Norfolk uh, State lost by? Oh, I don't know. Who's to say? 36. Like well, then, okay, just let's <laughs> keep know, it coming. Sarah, meanwhile, we, uh, we don't have time, Pablo. Got to move on. Let's talk we men's tournament jar, action. <laughs> We got a wide open Sweet 16 after number one seeded Baylor, a pair of twos in Kentucky and Auburn, and threes in Wisconsin and Tennessee all got bounced over the weekend. But I want to talk about the winners, a Sweet 16 of them. So Harry, whose run has impressed you the most? I think for me, I still feel the most confident in Gonzaga. They took Georgia State's best punch. They stayed in that game a lot longer than I think any of us thought they would, and they still ended up winning that game by a large margin. They saw a Memphis team that had improved vastly over the year that had high expectations coming into the season. Memphis put up a great fight and has their own guys that are going to be in the league as well. And to me, if you are Gonzaga, like, were parts of those games concerning? Yeah, they were. But also, if you're the number one overall seed, you're always going to get somebody's best punch. And Gonzaga still, to me, has everything that you need to win a tournament title in the year 2022. You've got experienced guys like a Drew Timmy, and you've got the young phenoms like a Chet Holmgren. So to me, if you're Gonzaga, I think you should still feel really good about where you're at today. Is he Gonzaga or somebody else? Yeah, I was going to be hesitant. I was hesitant a little bit about Gonzaga, given the way that they didn't really perform in that first half against Memphis. But then I just realized that Memphis is a team full of athletes, and they were really good, at least individually, uh, in that first half against uh Gonzaga. And so you look at that second half and you see, okay, where is this rescue act going to come from? Is it going to be a freshman like Homer? But ended up being Timmy taking over offensively, just hitting a bunch of difficult shots. And frankly, sometimes in a tournament, you're going to need that from somebody. Uh, and to have it as your, your, basically your best player in Drew Timmy is pretty ideal there. The thing that concerns me about Gonzaga is that bench. They scored a total of two points. Mm. And, you know, eventually they're going to need some sort of support there. And so that would be the one issue. Uh, Houston's been really impressive, especially after losing uh, their best scorer uh, earlier in the season in December getting to this run. And, of course, Miami's been really good, too. But Gonzaga's got to be my favorite right now. Pablo Torre, who's impressed you the most? Yeah, I was going to say Carolina because they beat Baylor. But then I remembered that Norfolk State loosened the jar, was, I was trying to say there, Sarah, <laughs> for Carolina. So can't give them full parts on that. But Arizona, I watched this game late last night, did not expect to watch Arizona win a game in which the last 20 minutes against TCU involved three of the best dunks in a <laughs> single game that I've ever seen, right? We had Matherin with the throwdown in the paint, which is just objectively great in a vacuum. Then at the very end, we had the putback dunk by Coloco, who was putting away the game in overtime that way. And then in the middle, the meat on that sandwich <laughs> was just a young man, Terry, going full Leroy Jenkins, <laughs> just trying to put the game away as the clock did not have nearly enough time, but throwing down a dunk anyway. I know they should have won by more, but just the fact that that was so entertaining, that was most impressive to me. Thank you for rewarding my investment of time, Arizona. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning Leroy Jenkins, although I wouldn't want one on my team, especially not in the tournament. Sedano, who you got Arguably most impressive not. so far? I think impressive is the key word here in this question, and I'm not going to be a front runner like Harry or Pablo and pick one seeds like Arizona or Gonzaga. Like, I'm going to tell you about the kids from Ames, Iowa, mm. who won two games yes. last year. Iowa State, to me, is the most impressive run thus far. Two games, dos, as I mentioned last season. And TJ Otzelberg, what a great story for TJ Otzelberger. He literally grew up six miles from the arena where he beat Wisconsin yesterday, and now he's basically going to, you know, same region where he goes to Chicago now to face Miami, where it'll probably end, but it's got to be the kids from Ames because they were pretty yeah. brutal last season, and now they're in the Sweet 16.
an incredible turnaround. By the way, nobody mentions the Peacocks over Kentucky on Thursday, over Murray State on Saturday. Next up, they get Purdue. So I ask you, looking ahead, how real are the St. Peter's Peacocks, George, and how fun to say is St. Peter's Peacocks? <laughs> it's very fun to say St. Peter's Peacock. Uh, they lost the game on February 20th, Sarah, to Siena, who was ranked 255 <laughs> in Ken Palm. So for them to be able to beat Kentucky, a blue blood, wow. and then Great beat that. one of the best mid-major teams we have in the tournament in Murray State is extremely impressive. They are legit. Purdue is, is, is a different animal, though. I, I think that they will not be caught by surprise after what we mm -hmm. saw this, this past weekend. Harry. St. Peter's Peacocks got a chance to keep it moving? I think they do. They're hot at the right time, and that's a big deal when it comes down to March Madness. But for me, the impressive part here is I know we had a 15 that got to the Sweet 16 last year in Oral Roberts, but to beat a Kentucky team that was a very, very popular title pick, to beat them in the fashion that they did, and then you also beat Murray State, one of the best mid-majors of the last five years and very consistent team, a very good team. To beat both of those kinds of teams is incredibly impressive, and they've been playing really, really good defense. They've worked their way up to 28th in Ken Palm in defense, and that is not a team that really was good in any statistical category at all during the season. So to not only just improve in the way that they have, but beat the teams that they have is incredible. Izzy, St. Peter's, is this run going to keep going? Yeah. Probably not. Probably not. It was impressive that it even started the way it did uh, against Kentucky after losing their best player to foul trouble in like the first couple of minutes there, but ended up doing that as well. And then, look, I just love Shaheen Holloway as a coach. I think he's made for TV coach. I think he's perfect for this tournament. He's somebody that some of us even obviously remember from his playing days, and he's just a good underdog type of coach, so it's really fun to watch him on this. Yeah, I do remember Harry uh, was a big fan of him during his playing days. I'm sorry, he probably wasn't born. Uh, let's go to Pablo yeah. Torre. Any hope for the Peacocks? Yeah, I mean, there's hope because the Peacocks of St. Peter's have had the best two-point defense, that is, shots within the arc. No one in the country has been better than St. Peter's over the last 10 games. So they have figured something out. I think Shaheen Holloway is excellent. And yes, his voice, his gravelly Queens voice after games is a delight. And also, as a guy who can't really grow a mustache and is Jesuit educated, Doug Eddard, <laughs> like that dude, just having the greatest time of his life is inspirational yeah. on that level. You too. lost the whole team and Doug, which is a tough one. Uh, moving on, you can't have a St. Peter's without a Kentucky on the other side. Calipari apologizing to fans after that loss, but they weren't the only top team to go down. So Pablo, I go to you for disappointments tournament and otherwise, who has had the most disappointing yeah. performance here? It has to be Coach Cal, Sarah, and it's because he's watching the tide turn in ways that are eye-opening even to me. You think a guy with that kind of a resume, that sort of an NBA alumni network, is just golden for the rest of his life. But no, people are asking real questions mm -hmm. as to how good a coach is he really if he loses to St. Peter's with all those NBA players on his team, allegedly. So yeah, mm -hmm. Coach Cal, legitimately worried. Well, financially, too, the gap between those two programs. Izzy, who's sure. the biggest loser of the tournament so far? Yeah, I don't think anybody gets attacked as much when they lose as Coach Cal does, but I'm going to expand that and just say the South e Southeastern Conference when you've got Auburn as well losing by 18 to Miami. you got Tennessee losing as a three seed. Mm -hmm. I think overall they expected to do a lot better. That Kentucky team didn't seem to me like a sort of prototypical Coach Cal team, but they definitely should have gotten past the first. Woody Page had us all sold on an underseeded Tennessee. Out. Harry, who's your biggest loser so far? <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's got to be Auburn. Uh, they looked like easily, a, they looked like a Final Four shoo-in during the regular season. They gave Bruce Pearl a big, new, shiny contract, and they just didn't look like themselves at any point during the tournament. I think it's it's got to be easily Auburn at this point. Auburn was showing some signs, though, near the end of the regular season of doubt for sure. Sedano, who was your biggest loser so far? I'm going to go with Kentucky, Sarah. Coach Cal, the, the, the thing you hear the most about Kentucky kids when they get into the draft and when they get on new teams in the NBA is, well, you know, they didn't really harness all of their potential at Kentucky because they're playing a team game is what we hear. Is it that? Or maybe Cal isn't maximizing his potential when he has them at Kentucky. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly something that's going to be talked about even more after this tournament run and 